Hello viewers, thank you for joining me. Every single January, I tell myself that this is the year I'll read more manga. There are so many good series out there without anime adaptations. But this might be the year it actually happens. I spent a good chunk of last year collecting, so now I've got quite a few series completed and just waiting to be read, and I knew which one I wanted to start out the new year with. Behind the scenes is the story of Ranmaru Kurisu, a first-year college student who came to the city basically to escape the rougher lifestyle of the little fishing village where he grew up. Except, one semester in and he still hasn't managed to make any friends. Ranmaru is a constant nervous wreck and has never really fit in anywhere. One day, he sits down on a bench to eat his lunch only to discover it's part of the set for one of the university's film clubs a second later, when the zombie chase scene crashes in. They have to stop shooting, of course, and this ruined take used up the last of the fake gore they had on hand, so Ron Maru finds himself trying to make things up to the art squad, a ragtag group of five, now six, students who run around after all four of the school's film clubs, helping them with their sets, props, costumes, basically all the things that make a movie come to life. The art squad is perpetually broke and overworked and can use all the help they can get. The thing about Ranmaru, though, is that his mind's not the only thing that's constantly working. While he's in his head, overthinking whatever awkward interactions he's had that day, his hands are crafting whatever's available. Like, if he was holding a piece of paper, he'd probably have some origami animal by the end of it. And in some ways, his anxiety works in his favor. Overthinking things the way he does means he's usually the first to notice tiny details and where things could go wrong. Ryuji Goda is the pushy but passionate art squad leader, and he sees what an asset Ranmaru could be right away. So, while Ranmaru's default setting is to apologize and run away, Goda drags him back. And though Goda is pretty demanding and kind of intimidating, he's also really good at encouraging people to be better versions of themselves. He tells Ranmaru to stop making excuses and use his skills to actually solve his problems, and it does get through to him. As Ranmaru helps them through one art-themed crisis after another, he starts to experience something that's never happened to him before. He starts to feel like he belongs here. That's the very bare basics of the story. Awkward but artsy kid goes away to college and finally finds a place he fits in. But I wouldn't be bothering to make this video if there wasn't so much more to it. Obviously, the real story takes place during all the little adventures that happen along the way. This is a very character-driven story. But before I get into those characters... Behind the Scenes is a seven-volume manga written, drawn, and thought up by Bisco Hattori. If you recognize that name, it's most likely because she created Oran High School Host Club. Now, I loved Oran, but I was a little apprehensive to read another club-based series by the same author. I don't like to see creators fall into that hole, trying to start something new, but accidentally recreating the same idea or dynamic that made them successful once. So I was on guard to see the host club again, just masquerading as different characters. But I was happy to be proven wrong again and again. I mean, right away it was clear that Ranmaru is no Haruhi, and Goda doesn't really have anything in common with Tamaki either. I really liked all the characters, but sometimes what I liked more was that they weren't familiar at all. There was no one who was introduced and made me think, well, I've found the Kiyoya of the group, or anything. They were two very different casts of characters, but they were equally enjoyable. Ranmaru is the type of main protagonist that I could see getting on some people's nerves. Personally, I found him very easy to relate to. I'm also a chronic overthinker, and I love these types of stories. The outcast finding a place where everyone accepts him. But Goda was the more interesting character, right from the start. Perhaps because he was a little harder to understand. First impressions would lead you to believe he's aggressive and demanding and hard to get along with. And he is two of those things. But he accepts Ranmaru right away. In fact, he's probably the least judgmental of the group. 
Goda is interested in everything. His apartment is overflowing with books on things he's studied. In the second volume, the crew is setting up an otaku's room for one of the film club movies, and Goda bribes a real otaku on campus into letting them use things from his collection. But then the actors walk in, and are impressed by the room, but start making fun of the loser who must own all this stuff. And Goda lays into them for mocking what they don't understand, pointing out the craftsmanship on the figures, and just making it clear in general that he sees it as just another equally respectable art form. And I mean, I think it's kind of a given that that scene is going to play well with anime and manga fans, but it made Goda seem a lot more approachable to me, and to Ranmaru too. I think what really won me over with Goda is that he's absolutely the kind of personality that would normally steamroll over weaker people, like our main protagonist here, but he's constantly getting after Ranmaru to make his own voice heard. He genuinely cares about what others think and feel, and he appreciates anything that someone had to work hard to accomplish. The Art Squad Chief and their new Super Rookie are the two that stand out the most, right from the start, but I loved all the characters as I got to know them better. Ruka is their costume specialist. She's very sweet and hardworking, and as she describes herself later on in the series, way too good at being polite. Her passion for her craft came from an aunt who was a seamstress but that was actually very out of the norm in her world. Ruka comes from a very wealthy family of doctors, and is facing a lot of pressure from them to live her life a certain way. Masa, their special effects makeup artist, is a lot less refined, but a lot of fun. She's another one who never really fit in anywhere, but the only aspect of her life where this seems to bother her is that her zombie obsession keeps scaring off all her dates. Tomu is, hands down, the most fun character, and holds a special place in my heart. His obsession is with Saturday morning cartoons and superheroes. He joined a gang when he was in high school because he wanted to be part of a team, but took them down himself when he realized he'd accidentally become one of the bad guys. Tomu is the only one with no artistic talent to speak of. He's the group's muscle. The one they send to run, literally, to the convenience store when they run out of something, or do all the heavy lifting. But he's a little like Goda in that he has so much respect for all the other members of the squad because he appreciates their talents. And it's not like anyone looks down on Tomu for having a different skill set than the rest of them. All the chapters that focus on Tomu are narrated in a simpler, almost more innocent manner. Anytime he was around, it was just a lot of fun. And then we have Izumi, who's perhaps the most traditionally artistic of the group. Goda found him sketching in the art room one day and recruited him. Izumi's the one who draws up all the blueprints and rough drafts for their sets. I like to describe Izumi as being dreamy in every sense of the word. He's the pretty one, always surrounded by a flock of hopeful girls but he's also a total airhead, liable to wander away from you mid-conversation because he forgot you were talking. So Izumi was a lot of fun in a different way, and super easygoing characters like that are easy to like anyway. I actually have a lot more to say about Izumi, but nothing that doesn't go into spoilers, so we'll come back to him. Finally, there's one more character who feels like she should be included in this group, even though she was never officially a member of the art squad. Ranmaru is staying with family so he can commute to the school, and his younger cousin So soon finds herself caught up in his club's adventures. At first she comes across as being very harsh and intimidating, but it's not long before we realize she's basically the female version of Ranmaru, constantly overthinking and worrying about everything. So is the top student, and one of the top athletes, at the prestigious all-girls high school she attends. But this doesn't come along with all the petty drama and bullying you usually see from stories about girls' schools. All her classmates adore so and strive to be like her. Meanwhile, she's suffocating under the weight of that pressure. She had a line I really liked about how she actually works really hard for her grades and tennis skills, but everyone assumes those things just come naturally to her, and she doesn't want to let anyone down by revealing the truth. But she slowly starts to get more comfortable being true to herself by spending time with the art squad, 
basically starting to appreciate that no one is actually perfect, but everyone can be impressive under the right circumstances, even her openly neurotic mess of a cousin. This isn't the kind of story that has a real concrete story until nearly the very end. It's the characters and the draw of getting to know them all better that's the real appeal here. Which isn't to say that those mini-adventures with each of the film clubs weren't interesting, too. Behind the scenes is big on getting detailed with how all their projects are made, too. What kind of materials you could use to make them at home, that sort of thing. The little author's note panels tell the story of a different adventure. All the places Visco Hattori went and all the people who mentored her in all these different crafts so she could write about them properly. It's so easy to feel the passion she had for this series. Which is why it sucks that it felt like it was cut short before she was ready for it to end. If there's one non-spoilery complaint I have, it's that the last volume feels a little rushed. Those author note panels confirm that she had to cut some things for time. It does get a concrete ending. You don't have to worry about this one just dropping off. But I'm also sure it would have had a different feel to it if Hattori had gotten to say everything she'd wanted to. Behind the Scenes has some great, deeper character moments, but overall it's very lighthearted and it's a really easy read. It's the kind of series I would pick out to relax, but I did end up getting really invested in the characters and their lives, too. That being said, there are some things I want to discuss in more detail, so if you don't want to hear spoilers, it is absolutely my recommendation that more people should read this series. And that's your cue to click away, because I'm going to start with the very end. I'm a little at odds with the last volume, and it's not just that it felt rushed. It's a big thing throughout that Ron Maru is building his confidence with each volume, and I loved seeing it. He's on almost every cover, too. You can see him looking a little less panicked with each one. It just took a turn near the end that I wasn't crazy about. Ranmaru, Ruka, and Izumi were all inspired by a short film about an old toy maker at some point in their lives. By going through the library's movie archives, Ranmaru discovers that it was directed by Goda. It was the last movie Goda ever made. The toy maker short was a eulogy for his grandfather, and it won an amateur competition. Despite his tough talk, Ranmaru also uncovers that fear of failure after such success has kept Gota from trying again. So Ranmaru decides to turn the tables. He pesters Gota relentlessly about making another movie. But it just doesn't have the same feel to it that you get when Gota convinces someone to believe in themselves again. It's not the sort of thing that should work if you try to force it, and it kind of feels like it does only because time was running out. But let's not leave this on a negative note. Izumi was easily my favorite character. Ruka's family troubles were just as interesting, but I think this has gone on long enough that I'll limit this to one character highlight. For someone so airheaded, I think Izumi had the most layers to him. There were a lot of things that went unsaid. There was an air of mystery about him from the beginning, just because Ranmaru usually struggled to understand what he said. He learns pretty early on that Izumi has a thing for antiques. He says it's because he doesn't have a history of his own, so he's really drawn in by anything that does. But it's a while later before he remembers to tell Ranmaru why this is. There was some sort of accident when Izumi was 15. He fell from a high ledge and ended up with amnesia from the head trauma. He can't remember anything from before he woke up in the hospital. And given that, like, six years have passed, it seems unlikely anything's going to start triggering those childhood memories now. As far as anyone can see, Izumi seems pretty unbothered by this. Izumi seems pretty unbothered by everything. It was the amnesia storyline that really got us into his head. In a lot of ways, Izumi is genuinely that easygoing, ditzy guy we see on the surface, but this is mostly because he's given up. He tries to escape the pressure to regain his memories by simply accepting that it's out of his control, but you can see how much it pains him that every time he goes home, which notably isn't nearly as often as he could, his mother always asks, 
so hopefully whether he's remembered anything, and how guilty he feels for having to disappoint her every single time. It's something I really wish they'd had more time to explore, because, maybe not with this particular mindset, but I think a tale of learning to let go of the things you really have no control over is an important story to tell. It's not necessarily a bad thing that Izumi's trying to just move on with his life, but there came a point where it became pretty clear that he has a habit of running away from his problems. You can't tell me it's a coincidence he just happened to wander away as soon as So finally worked up the courage to ask him the serious questions. Ultimately, they run into some old friends of his who assure him that his personality has remained pretty much unchanged despite the amnesia, and they kinda just leave it at that. I really didn't think this was going to turn into one of those monster reviews. You know what? Screw it. Might as well talk about Ruka, too. Because their struggles are very similar. She has also given up and is trying to convince herself that everything's fine because she chose to accept her fate, but of course she's still unhappy, whether she wants to acknowledge it or not. Ruka's situation was an interesting twist on a pressure-from-a-stuffy-wealthy-family story for me. Ruka actually had a lot of hope that she'd get to live her life the way she wanted to, until she was about ten and her mother died. Ruka's stepmother is actually very kind and good to her, but she comes from a lower background and the rest of the family is cold to her. She's also suffocating under that pressure, and wants to prove she can at least raise Ruka in a way they approve of. Ruka knows it's not fair to her either, and does her part to make things easier, even though it comes at a personal cost. She describes her one big rebellion as being her decision to go to a regular college instead of some fancy, prestigious university, but her family is already setting up a marriage for after she graduates. I really like all the scenes with Ruka's family. She recognizes a lot of people around her are chained to circumstances and expectations they wouldn't have chosen for themselves. She does her best not to be the cause of anyone's stress or misery. Ruka's typically the person who comes in and fixes everyone's problems, and I think that's generally an admirable trait. As the series goes on, her stepmother starts to realize just how important her work with the art squad is to Ruka, and it was great to see her find her courage and stand up to the family, telling them that, as Ruka's mother, she does have a right to having some say in Ruka's future, and thankfully, she wants Ruka to do whatever will make her happy. But at the end of the day, it's still someone else making the decision for her, we had all this build-up for Ruka finally learning to stand up for herself, but she never really does. It kinda feels like behind the scenes failed at telling the same story twice. But overall, I did really enjoy this series. As a whole, it was uplifting and heartwarming, and offered a perspective you don't usually see. Stories about film or theater usually want to tell the stories about the people on stage, but those productions would never get off the ground without groups like The Art Squad. There is a reason I wanted to end off my year, and start out yours, with this one. I'm glad it did turn out to be so… wholesome. And despite some disappointments with the ending, I definitely recommend it. Thank you for watching.